Hello, and welcome to the Business of Story. I'm your host, Park Howell, and I am so proud to welcome Sendable as our sponsor. Sendable is the social media management platform that I personally prefer to handle all of our storytelling online. Sendable has generously offered you, an ardent Business of Story listener, an incredible 30% discount on their traction plan. It's normally $99 a month, but if you use my link, you can get it for just $69 a month. So visit sendable.com forward slash park30 to start your free 30-day trial today. I thought it was just a stupid picture of a pig in the ocean. But after hearing that story, I had to have it. Now I wasn't just buying a picture. I was buying a story. Story literally made the picture worth more money to me. That's what businesses are about. People buy brands. People buy stories much more than anything else. I work with a lot of big enterprise companies, but let's just say I always tell folks, drop the PowerPoint, close your laptops, start with your story. If you want people to get engaged and you want people to act, you have to tell them an emotionally powerful story. That's with great characters, it's with uncertain outcomes, and it's with high stakes and drama. All business strategy is a story. In today's noisy and cynical world, I believe that if your brand does not stand for something bigger than just making money, it will not stand out among your competition and certainly won't connect with your best and most loyal customer. And I can prove it. Have you seen the new study out that identifies what consumers really want from their brands? It's called the Poll Factor Project. By using comprehensive market research and deploying new brand building practices, the Poll Factor Project helps brands drive more relevance, build deeper relationships with consumers, and shift behavior to fuel a culture of sustainable living for all. I mean, how can you argue with that? For me, one of the most powerful findings in this report is pinpointing what motivates today's consumer to engage with your brand, and it provides the secrets to the kinds of brand stories you should be telling, but only if you stand for something. On today's show, we have one of the study's co-authors, Raphael Bemperat. Raphael is a founding partner at BBMG, a brand and social innovation consultancy that unites branding, sustainability, and innovation to help organizations unleash shared value with humanity at the center of their story. An expert in brand strategy, social innovation, consumer marketing, and public affairs, Raphael has designed consumer and nonprofit brands, created national advocacy campaigns, drafted public policy, and managed communications for local, state, and federal elected officials. For Raphael, branding is being. It's not just a discipline of strategy and design, it's the essence of who we are, with the possibility to inspire great transformations for organizations and society. Prior to co-founding BBMG, Raphael served as communications director at Do Something, where he oversaw marketing, media relations, and cause-related partnerships with Levi Strauss and Company, Kenneth Cole, and Rolling Stone. Raphael's extensive background in political communications began as a press aide to Texas Governor Ann Richards. He is an advisory board member for Sustainable Brands, the NYU Stern Center for Sustainable Business, and Read Global. In 2009, Raphael was named one of Conscious Company Media's top 22 conscious business leaders. On today's show, he will share findings from the Poll Factor Project that will guide your own brand storytelling. He'll explore how you can overcome the four noisiest issues in the daily news cycle that you not only have to compete with, but are influencing consumer attitudes and behaviors. You'll learn the current seven need states of your customers and how to connect with them. Plus, Raphael shares some favorite examples of impactful brand storytelling that you can take a tip or two from. All that and more right now with Raphael Bemperad on the business of story. Raphael, welcome to the show. Park, it's a delight to be here. Thank you for welcoming us. Yeah, you know, I first came across you all at Sustainable Brands Conference in San Diego. It was six or seven years ago, and I saw you for the first time on stage, and you were rolling out, introducing your aspirational research. 
which I found very helpful. In fact, used many, many times in working with our own clients at the time and helping them refine and define their purpose-driven brand story. Since then, I've been an avid purveyor of your website and your case studies and your emails you send out because honestly, I cannot think of an agency that is doing better, more powerful, more connecting work in the world of sustainability and purpose-driven brands and what you guys are doing at BBMG. So it's just an absolute pleasure to have you here on the show. Oh, thank you so much. Now, a company, you know, co-founded by yourself is not successful unless it is really an expression of the founder, you know, yourself. How do you find yourself in this world and in the the work you're doing now. And can you take us to a time, and it might have even been when you were a kid, that in hindsight, you look back and you found a moment that really has changed your life at the time and maybe informs who you are today. I so love and welcome the question. I am a, a son of a very progressive rabbi who teaches every year at the Vatican, as well as a social worker and child development expert who dedicated her life to helping young children bond in the first years of life with a loving and caring uh, adult and caregiver. And, you know, our dinner table at home was often, you know, all often about things like the movies or what was happening day to day. But more often than not, it was asking the big questions. It was asking, you know, why are we here and what matters in the world and what is our responsibility to each other? It would be conversations about philosophy and and literature and and increasingly the responsibility that we have to one another as human beings. And with a, you know, very progressive rabbi and interfaith leader and a and a mom who was dedicated to helping children develop the capacity for connection and relationship, it really shaped a sense of a a deep desire to be of service in the world and to see every day as an opportunity to live your own creativity in such a way that it enhances the capacity for other people to be creative and successful and flourish together. And so I was involved in, in, you know, politics and nonprofits as a kid. I remember in high school, we were a relatively progressive family in a conservative neighborhood in suburban Dallas. And I remember, you know, like being on the soccer team after school, you know, in the weight room and arguing about, you know, the the merits of a deficit and why it was important to, you know, make sure that you ran the government in in a way that was sound and, you know, investing in people and communities. And my friends were looking at me like, what are you talking about? (laughs) But I would say that the BBMG, our, our brand consultancy, was really born from a vision in graduate school where my co-founder, Mitch Baranowski, and I were both teaching assistants for the same professor of utopian literature. And it was this incredible course that asked from pre-Socratic philosophy all the way to Harlequin romances to science fiction movies. It was about asking what is the good life and what is the good society and what is a good organization And he challenged his students, and I remember the seminar, it was the first part of the semester, and he looked in our eyes and he said, are you here in this class in college, are you here just to make a living or are you here to make a life? And that really became the mantra for BBMG, which was how might we leverage the power of brand to drive positive impact in the world and help all of our team not just make a good living, but to make a good life and leverage the power of brand for some positive impact in the world. And this was obviously 16 years ago, prior to, I think, a lot of what the rise of, of, you know, purpose branding and, and really looking at impact through marketing and communications. It was early days. But from the very beginning in day one of BBMG, we were asking how might brands be a transformational vehicle in society. And that had been our aspiration from day one. So I, I think in, in retrospect, it was grandparents and parents who had always seen themselves not only in their particular jobs, but as part of something bigger and a desire to, you know, make a positive contribution in the world. And then in college, a really foundational professor, John Rodden, who shaped us to build an agency that would really embody the best of humanity and and make a positive impact. Where did you go to school? UT Austin. Um, oh. So University of Texas at Austin. Hook them horns. That's where my wife Exactly, the long one. Yep. 
And so you didn't start BBMG right out of school, did you? You did some other things. What prepared you to start the agency? I was uh, really lucky right out of college uh, working on a political campaign for a governor of Texas named Ann Richards before she became governor. And I showed up after doing a training program and they asked, you know, well, what do you like to do? And I was like, I love to write. I love speaking. I love whatever can be of help. And they said, okay, great. And they introduced me to Suzanne Coleman, who was the chief speechwriter for, for Ann Richards, who was then state treasurer running for governor. And I started writing speeches for surrogates, for the press office. And by a miracle, we won by, you know, maybe 100,000 votes statewide. And I had the privilege of joining Ann Richards' administration as a press aide and a, a junior speechwriter with Suzanne. And just being in the milieu of a, a really thoughtful political leaders, and Ann in particular, who I had the opportunity to witness in so many different environments, from you know oil executives in Houston to farmers in West Texas to preachers in South Dallas to gay rights activists in Austin. And you just saw a human being who was just so capable of authentically embodying her values while connecting and communicating with clarity and passion to so many different kinds of audiences. So it was a master class in communication. It was a master class in storytelling. And I had the privilege of, of working with remarkable people, but really witnessing and observing one of the great political speakers and thinkers in, in our era, modern era. And so Anne was a great education. And she, I think, taught me a lot, and all of us a lot, about how to communicate in ways that people can hear you and, and speaking simply and plainly and clearly about the things that matter. When you were a speechwriter, did they have set frameworks that you had to follow or did you just kind of have to wing it and learn it on your own? Well, Suzanne was a spectacular mentor and Ann Richards obviously was one of the great political speakers of our time. And, you know, Suzanne really taught me that people do things for their reasons, not for your reasons. And a big part of my job was doing research of the audiences we were, we were speaking to and having a deeper sense of empathy for what was happening in their lives and what was going on in their town. And was the high school football team winning this year? And, you know, who was the teacher in the school that everyone looked up to and cared about? And, you know, is the community that we're speaking with thriving or in, in the middle of challenge and what that looks like so that not only could we craft stories that people could see themselves in and that honored their experience and their aspirations, but also that we could make sure that what we were trying to accomplish together was deeply rooted in their reality and their priorities. And I think that was a great and humbling education, you know, to really be a listener above all. Well, and it takes the time and the energy and the caring to actually go and dig that deep into people's lives. And it seems to me that most brands and a lot of their, their brand managers simply don't take the time to do that. And yet that seems to be where the real gold is if you're going to connect with your audiences from their worldview, not the brand's worldview. I think one of the founding principles and the core of the ethos of BBMG has always been start with empathy and identify what is sacred in the hearts and minds of your audience above all. And that really starts with an open slate of listening to people's stories and their experiences so that you can connect for a brand what you're really best at with the deeply held needs and aspirations of the audience. And ultimately, our belief around brand purpose is it's this intersection between the deeply felt needs and aspirations, often unmet needs and aspirations of your audience, meeting the unique way that you can create value, not only for their lives, but also for the world together. And it's that harmony, it's that connection between what you're really great at in your own work as a brand and what you offer with the most deeply held values and aspirations of the audience. That's where purpose is born. And identifying you know, the way that you create value bigger than the product that meets their needs and does something together that can make a, an impact in the world, that's where purpose thrives. And, and it does start absolutely with the core of empathy and listening and deep respect and appreciation for the, the experience of the audience above all. So in your early career working with Ann Richards, 
do you have a moment that really stands out in your mind that this was underscored to you when you got in it for the first time and you were doing this digging? Was there a constituent or a constituent out there or something where it hit you over the head and you had that aha moment that this is kind of the secret sauce? Well, I think both for me and for many across the nation, Anne gave a speech at the uh, 1988 Democratic Convention. She was the keynote speaker. And uh, it's an absolute masterpiece of political communication, but also predominantly part of storytelling. And, you know, there's a lot going on when you're framing a moment for a political campaign and for a candidacy for a president. And in this particular speech, Anne stepped back and acknowledged, you know, what people were feeling and what, you know, what the incumbent president had created. And she just walked it down to the simplest terms of what it meant for her growing up in, you know, Lacey, Lakeview, outside of Waco, Texas, the value she inherited from her grandparents, looking around at her her friends and her peers, and the distance between what they most cared about and what they most yearned for as as Americans and what they were experiencing every day, and just being someone who could be on their side. And she didn't do it by screaming policy platforms, and she didn't talk about five-point plans. She told stories about Americans who were yearning for an audience that saw them and heard them and validated who they were and mostly what they wanted to be. And she tells the story at the very end of sort of imagining the future that we're creating for our children and what we could ultimately be proud to have created. And she just lands it in such a beautiful way that you believe in something so much bigger than Ann Richards. You believe in an America where everyone's heard and included and has a shot. And it it was just exquisite because it broke it down to the simplest human terms. And she talks about rolling a ball back and forth with her granddaughter and thinking through the lens of her granddaughter's experience. And, And she just brings it home. And that was a moment where I believed in politics, which I already did, but in a much deeper way. And it made me want to show up for Anne's campaign, which I had the privilege to be part of when she ran two years later for governor. And that started it for me. And I think it just electrified the country in a plain spoken way that this was something that mattered. And that's interesting. So you've thrown me now a question that I've got to ask. What should or could the Democrats be doing now to try to be competitive against Donald Trump? And what aren't they doing in this, maybe, you know, in your eyes, relative to storytelling? I think there's a lot of noise that happens when we try to follow a a daily news cycle. And I think when you're in that noise, you end up just on this sort of gerbil wheel. Uh, And it's just the cacophony of each side playing to their most superficial talking points. But I think if you can sort of tune that out and move from a day to day to a slightly longer perspective and try to tune into what's slightly deeper and under the surface. I was really, and this speaks back to empathy, which is there's a lot happening right now that people are trying to navigate. We're dealing with a probably once in a hundred year economic transformation. We're in the first ever ecological transformation where the very premise of our species is at risk. And we're looking at changes in technology Uh, that are redefining the role of human beings in society. And if you take the confluence of an ecological tipping point, an economic tipping point, and a technological tipping point, you bring those things all together at one time, we're, we're navigating a lot. And then if you look at, you know, particularly the swing states like a Michigan or a Wisconsin, And the sort of disruption around manufacturing, moving from a stable job that you're in for life in a union that has your back to things that are being outsourced left and right, not only to other people in other parts of the world, but to technology and machines. And you're looking for something that can hold this ground under you. And I think, you know, for the political process, you know, whether you're for Donald Trump or not, you have to respect 
that he's speaking to people's fears and he's speaking to people's realities. And I think what matters most for uh, the right kind of political conversation is that we get in tune with what people are really feeling. And we start to think about, okay, we're in the middle of a great transformation. What does it look like to act on our American values of opportunity, responsibility, and community? What does it look like to create solutions that are honest about the transformations that are happening, but that are are real and actionable to help people at different ages and stages of life and in different communities live a little bit better and feel a little bit safer and stronger and, and feel that they're part of something that's has a future and can get better if we all give it a shot. And right now I fear we're making just things around, you know, the personality of Donald Trump or his particular behaviors, which I think obviously are appropriately being called out. But even more than that, Donald Trump is a symptom and not just a cause. And I think we have to understand what people are going through. And if we can speak to people's deeper honest fears, but also their aspirations. And we can speak to what has always been an American story of solving challenges together, being creative together, being the most innovative and leading country in the world because of our values. Then we're in a good place. And if if that can be the conversation that we have, I think then the right candidates will win all up and down the ballot. And I think we're at a precipice, however, of such profound tribalism that we're not speaking to each other, we're not hearing each other, we're not honoring and respecting each other. We're just retreating to our corners. And this is a huge threat, not only for our discourse, it's not only a threat for brands, it's not only a threat for storytelling and communication, it's a threat for our country. And ultimately, you know, Park, to use story in the business of story to witness, to respect, to hear and honor, and then ultimately to frame what's possible, to frame a vision of the future we can see and believe in at a time of great transformation, then it'll work out. And if we just make it to the lowest common denominator and demeaning each other and seeing the least of each other, you know, then, then I think we're missing a generational shot to, yeah, now, uh, to transform. Yeah. And now's the time to do that, as you say, with those three significant transformations that we're going through. We typically have one, sometimes two, that, w- that we are dealing with. But yeah. in between economic, ecological, and technological, they are all coming two at us. It seems like it's sort of the pace of Moore's Law. It just seems like it is compounding. So you can see how people get caught up in the prop wash of the daily news cycle and that noise, and that they just kind of need to step back, take a breath. And for our leaders to take the time, as you did with the Ann Richards campaign, to really understand what is driving these people and show them a way forward. I love that concept about that's what America is. You know, the values and beliefs of America, we will overcome whatever challenge is thrown at us. But the only way we do that is when we do it together. We will never do that as a divided country. Amen to that. And, you know, one of the things that most excites me now about brands and the capacity for brands to tell stories is that we are dealing with these three tipping points, ecological, economic, and technological. And what is, has always been so intriguing to us at BBMG and and powerful for the work that we can all do in the discipline of branding and marketing is that brands are these unique vessels that hold both systems and stories inside of brands or business models and supply chains and ways of creating value and ways of designing to create value. And so brands are the expression of how systems come to life in value propositions and in products and services and experiences. But it's not just systems. It's also the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves. They are vessels for our sense of identity and aspiration and connection and belonging. And what brands allow us to do more than anything else I've seen in all of civilization is to bring together systems and stories and stories and systems. And we're at a moment with these three tipping points in mind where we have to redesign the systems for how we create value so that they're more sustainable and equitable. But we also have to retell the story 
of ourselves to ourselves and a sense of our humanity and who we are at this moment so that we can build a future that has our humanity and our shared humanity at the center. And so many brands, particularly those who are thinking about now sustainability and social impact and purpose at the core of, of embedding that into brands are thinking about, okay, how can brands be a transformational vehicle for redesigning the system and retelling the stories that we're telling ourselves? I'm so excited that that's a moment for brands to be bigger than they've ever been before, not just superficial sales vehicles or product vehicles, but really a deeper sense of purpose that can change business, can change the lives of our consumers, and can change communities for the better. So some listeners out there may think, oh, come on, there's no way a brand is going to do that. They have to answer to shareholders, to short-term vision. You know, they're really in it to just sell me something. So can you give us a couple examples? Who's a brand right now or brands that are doing a good job first with that systems piece that are demonstrating what you're talking about? Wonderful. Well, we've had the opportunity to work on many projects that are bringing circular design forward. So this idea of not just making a product once, selling it, and then it goes into the trash can and ultimately to a landfill, but thinking about value that uh, goes on and on and on. It's moving from selling a product to having access to a product or sharing a product or moving from a sale to a subscription or a membership. And one of the things that we've had the privilege of doing is working with the North Face, the apparel and technical performance brand on launching the North Face Renewed, which is taking clothing that's being refurbished and reselling it. And the way that we were able to bring that circular business model, so taking products that are already in circulation and can be refurbished and tuned up and washed up and ready for the next adventure, but it was telling a different story. It was telling a new story about, you know, the, why we buy clothing and the role of clothing in our lives. And the idea was all about adventure that never has to end. It was clothes remade to explore more and more and more and the revival of the fittest, reinforcing the technical performance of these great you know, clothing that the North Face makes, but being part of something bigger by making the world where adventure never has to end. And I think those are great examples. I'm super, you know, not our client, but very inspired by the partnership between Impossible Foods and Burger King to launch the Impossible Whopper. So I don't know if you had seen the Impossible Whopper, uh, but it's... Oh, yeah. Everybody's talking about everybody's it. Everybody's talking about it. I was and, at a Christmas party and the, the conversation around the table, believe it or not, was they just had an Impossible Whopper and they couldn't believe how good it was. And I'm going, Really? And so they, they're creating a totally different plant-based business model, bringing it to scale. And it's all about, you know, taste it. It's a try it and don't taste the difference. It's for Whopper fanatics. It's not for vegans alone. And I think that this is an example of a reimagined system and an emerging new story uh, that allows us to get all the pleasure we want out of the things that we're eating while doing things that are healthier for us and for the planet. These are just simple examples. I'm also really turned on by, you know, this is one that we all talk about, but in terms of embodying a purpose bigger than the product, the Colin Kaepernick moment with, you know, stand for something, even when it costs you everything, you know, believe in something and stand for something, even if it costs you everything. And I think that, you know, that idea and the campaign that it embodied, you know, just reintroduced, I think, a whole new generation of the power of the Nike brand. So turned on by that. I, I mean, I think uh, the, the storytelling of Airbnb and the sense of belong anywhere, I was totally blown away and inspired when they faced challenges in the system, noting that there was discrimination happening and people who had the same profiles, but names that sounded ethnic or um, different from sort of um, a white uh, European name, were getting less rentals and, and less opportunities on the platform. They reimagined everything. They hired a justice official from the former Obama administration to reimagine their policies. And they launched a campaign during the Super Bowl that said, the world's more beautiful when you belong. 
and asked every single person using the platform to commit to their non-discrimination policies. Again, revolutionizing how they're thinking about equity and inclusion, acting on their values and reinforcing a brand story about belonging. All of these are great examples to me about you know, doing business differently, standing for something bigger and starting to embody a story that's deeply meaningful to an audience while signaling the world that, you know, we're all trying to create and be part of. And those are great examples of brands that are very successful in the market by redesigning a system and telling a new story. Well, and Airbnb did a beautiful job with that belong anywhere too, at least in my opinion, when I believe it was 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, and they went in and did an economic impact study to see what the impact Airbnb has had on both sides of Berlin in bringing people together and economic development, whatever. The numbers were really pretty impressive. They got all kinds of of earned media around the world on that particular report, but in their research, they also found these amazing stories of the people, both the hosts and the travelers, that then they use to back up, you know, not only the economic development of it, but this idea of bringing worlds together. And they've got a wonderful documentary they made that they produced down to about a minute, 15 second animated short for, you know, particularly for the web to use, talking about a daughter bringing her father back to Berlin, who was once, he was once a guard on the Berlin Wall, and he was suffering from it. He could never quite get over the things that he had seen there, so she takes him back there to show them what a lovely place it's become, and they stayed at an Airbnb, and it turns out the Airbnb they stayed at happened to be the host of the guy that guarded the other side of the wall. They knew each other. I mean, talking about serendipity, but what a story that demonstrates the impact, their systems how they reimagine their system and talk about it and demonstrating that impact on the world. That's so powerful. And, you know, you, you, you made a very important point, which is that the skeptics are rightfully saying, whoa, that's all nice. You know, that's perfectly fine. But at the end of the day, how are you driving the bottom line and how are you meeting the short-term pressures of driving revenue and profits on quarterly returns? And I, I think that's reasonable. I want to note a couple sort of bigger shifts that are happening in culture and ultimately, frankly, in business that are pointing the way to why brands that embed a deeper sense of purpose, why brands that are thinking about sustainability and and equity, why brands that are being really thoughtful about redesigning systems and retelling stories are winning. And I'd say the first beat of this context and this is a body of research that we've done just recently, Park, was looking at you know, what is happening for the next generation and what are they expecting for brands? And it was fascinating when you look at Gen Z, these are young people who are now about 24, 25 and younger. And we looked at the 18 to 22 year old version of, of Gen Z. Those who are already in the market, starting to graduate from college, build their homes and lives, partner, settle into careers and into life. And we wanted to get a sense of what are their expectations. And it was really kind of stark and powerful what we learned. And, you know, Pete Buttigieg on the campaign trail has talked about intergenerational justice, that young people are looking around and they see the ecological, economic, and technological tipping points. And they're not, you know, feeling safe in their schools. The climate march is obviously uh, rallying a whole generation about this urgency of climate. And what they're, they're basically just saying BS, and they're saying the adults haven't done the job, and so they're ready to step up. And in our research, it couldn't validate that more, that by a five-to-one margin, Gen Z doesn't trust business to be acting in the best interest of society. Only one in four young people in Generation Z could name a single brand that they considered to have a purpose that was bigger than a product. And when we asked, well, what is purpose for brands? Like, what is the purpose of a brand or a company? They said more than three times, they're more likely to say that the purpose of a brand is to serve communities and society rather than just to make good products and services. And so you're at this moment where, you know, a new generation is looking to brands and they're experiencing society around them, $1 trillion of student debt, an ecological challenge that has 10 years or less to prevent irreversible climate change and looking at technology and just not only screen addiction and mental health issues, but 
the whole future of work and the workplace that they're arriving into. And so they're challenging business as usual 100%, and they are looking for brands to be more than just the products that they're selling. On the other hand, at the same time, our broad uh, research around all consumers of every generation this past year, rooted in uh, something called the Pull Factor Project, trying to really understand how brands move from sort of pushing their corporate responsibility or their purpose onto people, but actually pull people in to a bigger story and a, a bigger sense of purpose and meaning and impact. What we found is like three massive culture shifts that are happening across all generations. The first is the move from materialism to meaning and really meaning over materialism. When we ask people what's the good life and what does the good life even look like to you, out of 27 different factors, the number like top five was having meaningful relationships and being able to live in balance, you know, being able to live in the moment and appreciate what's in your life and healthy balance and work in life. And the last of the 27th was being able to afford luxury goods. Second to last was having a lot of money. So this big shift of meaning over material. Now people said, I want to be able to be in financially secure as I get older. That was top five, but luxury goods for their own right and just having a lot of money in its own at the bottom of what living a good life means. The second big shift was passion over profession. People were less likely to say climbing that career ladder, getting that title mattered to the good life, much more pursuing passions and pursuits that are meaningful and that mattered. And then the third was a shift around the very premise of the American dream. By a, a big proportion, it was things around experiencing a sense of happiness, even despite life's challenges, living in balance and a healthy balance around well-being and health versus having a car or buying a home significantly bigger percentages caring about happiness and balance. And so what you see here, you know, meaning over materialism, passion over just pro professional job titles and a new American dream re you know, rooted in happiness and balance. Okay, there's something bigger going on. These are tectonic shifts now happening in Gen Z and across generations that call for a new era of branding. And that branding is rooted in solving something bigger than just the product or category and standing for something bigger together. That excites me because ultimately, if you think about brands as the vessel for systems and stories, that opportunity to, to stand for something bigger and to solve for something bigger is the moment we're in. And I think it's the perfect era for brands to lead the way not as marketing vessels, not as a sales vehicle alone, not through advertising, but as a transformational vehicle in our lives. Now, the research I mentioned early on, a study you did, Aspirationals, what was that, about six or seven years ago you did that? Is We've that actually yeah, been tracking year over year the Aspirational uh, in about 20 different countries. So from about eight, seven, eight years ago until this past year, and continues through today, we've been studying the rise of the aspirational. That's right. And can you define the aspirational consumer for our listeners? Absolutely. So we tried to understand, it was, a, it was a very like sort of innocent question seven years ago. We wanted to understand to what degree do people's deeply held values and beliefs in any way inform the way they show up with brands and, and their shopping behavior and their relationship as consumers with the brands in their lives. And we identified sort of two axes, materialism, things like I love to shop, I care a lot about how I look in my style, I'm an influencer of my friends about trends and brands and causes on the materialism side. And then on the, the second axis was uh, social and environmental values. And it was things like I care a lot about the impact of my purchases, I want to make a positive difference, sometimes I feel guilty about my impact on the environment. And what we were able to plot in this intersection between materialism and meaning or materialism and social and environmental values was this rise of an aspirational consumer who was very much rooted in, you know, I need brands that perform. I need things that are accessible on price. I want things that are convenient. And I actually want brands to help solve things for me and join with brands to be part of something. 
but at the same time, they really were committed to driving positive impact with their purchase, that they didn't want to feel guilty about their purchase. They wanted to make a difference with their purchase. And at the intersection of those two axes was this really interesting 40% of the global population bigger than the advocates who were about 22% and even practicals who were about 29%, this 40% of the global market that was aspirational. And it was ultimately, it's a psychographic, it's a mindset. And the mindset is as follows. How do I meet my own needs without doing any harm to anyone else and be part of something bigger than myself? That's what they're looking for from brands. And at the end of the day, aspirationals are really compelling as a design target because they require you to deliver on price and performance to even be price of entry. But that's not it. They are eager to join with you to be part of something bigger that can make a difference. And they are yearning for brands to stand for something that's meaningful to them and to invite them in. So whether it's Tom Shoes or Heineken Open uh, Worlds or it's Airbnb or Impossible Whopper, these are all brands that are delivering, make a difference in my own life, help me make a positive impact in the world and connect me to people who share my needs and aspirations so I can be part of something bigger than myself. And that to us is the future of branding, not only because it's a, it skews to a younger generation, more than 50% of the Chinese are aspirationals, more than 50% of Indians are aspirationals, high 40% in South Africa, in Canada, in the UK, in Brazil. So what you're seeing is the emerging markets where young people are you know, increasingly moving in the middle class and becoming drivers of the market, aspirational values are at the very core of what they're looking for. But it's not just reserved for the young people, is it? I mean, they have impact on their parents and they have conversations around this purpose and finding more meaning and experiences than material goods. So what I took from your aspirational work too is it's not just limited to the millennials and the Gen Xers and, you know, you see it in baby boomers and other places. Exactly. The fact that it's a psychographic that is now sort of globally validated across age, income, and geography, and education, frankly, that you see this really rising up in culture around the world across all generations. It is sizable in every, you know, boomers and Gen Xers and Y and Z. It's representative there, but as you skew younger, it gets even bigger and bigger and bigger. And so I do think this is sort of a, a shift happening in culture writ large that points the way, I think, for brands to think about design and communications and storytelling in an, an exciting new way. And then, Raphael, how, with this new project you've got, the Poll Factor Project and the research you did there, bringing in a lot of big brands that you were working with alongside, what did you find different or that informed what you already knew about aspirationals? How is this particular project different than the earlier work you did? Well, it's a great question, and it, it gets to the heart of the idea of aspirational, which is, you know, as much as we may aspire to act in X, Y, or Z way, at the end of the day, we're often making choices based on price or convenience, and that's just reality. And I like aspirationals because they're the connecting point between the pragmatic practicals and the values-driven advocates that are exactly in the middle, and they need both. What this work called the Pull Factor Project was all about was how do we close the intent to action gap? If you look at a lot of consumer research, there's what people say and what they do. And they'll say, yeah, of course, I love brands that have a purpose. Of course, I love brands that make a positive difference. But their shopping behavior doesn't always match it because they're solving for price and for convenience and lots of practical needs. And that makes perfect sense. And so what we've recognized is that, you know, we price of entry to deliver a product that performs but that in the rise of gen z and the rise of the aspirational is no longer sufficient it's certainly price of entry but it's not now price of differentiation so the pull factor project was really trying to understand how do we close the intent to action gap both with consumers and for brands so 65 percent of consumers in our research want to do the right thing. They say that, yeah, absolutely, I want to buy brands that have a positive impact in the world. But only 26% said that they purchased a brand like that in the last month. And so there was a gap between you know, aspiration for purpose and action around purchase. For brands, you know, we heard that executives, 
of executives. This is according to The Economist, not our own research. Uh, 48% of business executives say that operating with a social purpose creates a competitive advantage, but 78% said that they feel their businesses fail to deliver on their purposeful pledges. And so there's a gap both on the brand side and on the consumer side. So we set out to close the gap uh, between intent and action. So for consumers to make sustainable products, sustainable living easier and more rewarding, and for brands to increase relevance and loyalty by standing for something bigger. Now, we did this with nine amazing global brand partners. So this was in partnership with P&G, Dr. Pepper Keurig, Estee Lauder, Johnson & Johnson, Heineken, National Geographic, Target, Happy Family, part of the Danone family, and VSL, which is a, a brand that makes baby wipes and that is a, really a leader on ingredients. And it was all about finding out what could close the gap. And what we revealed was a new branding model called the pull factor. And the pull factor model brings three things together. Very simple, super intuitive. What people want connected with what the world needs connected with what brands uniquely offer. So if you imagine a Venn diagram of what people want, what the world needs and how brands win by elevating their unique equities and what they offer, you can unlock the pull factor. And what we did inside of the research was we identified what were some more deeply held needs that unite consumers across categories. So obviously the partners were in CPG and they were in food and beverage and they were in retail with Target and they were in you know um, alcohol and beverage with Heineken and baby food. So very different brands. And what we identified, we did a combination of ethnographic research, which is deep qualitative, where you go into people's homes, you go shopping with them, you sit at the dinner table together, you cook, you look in the cupboards and in the bathroom and the closet, and you really try to understand day to day what matters, what's sacred in, in their lives, what are the you know artifacts in their lives from photography to totems that shape who they are and their values. And you get really deep. And then we tested that with a national poll and some deep qualitative online focus groups. And we found seven really powerful need states that unite consumers across different categories and that brands could design for. They were things like momentum, feeling a little bit of progress every day and learning and growing as a, as a person, belonging, being part of something bigger than myself, feeling a sense of worth, feeling recognized and valued for who you are feeling rooted, connected to nature and to rituals and traditions that can ground us in times of such change. Purpose, being, you know, really feeling like you have a life with meaning and you can make an impact. Simplicity, feeling nourished in a simple lifestyle, um, sort of back to basics and pairing it back to the simple needs. And then a sense of savvy, which is to sort of outsmart in your purchases and make the most of what you have. And interestingly, momentum, belonging, worth, rooted, purpose, simplicity, and savvy were all things that brands can design for in a way that helps them sort of find an emotional connection to a consumer, but equally importantly, design for a positive impact. So not only did we identify these seven need states, but we identified nine sustainable behaviors. So what people want are those seven need states. And those cultural shifts that I shared before, meaning over materialism, passion over profession, a new American dream rooted in happiness and balance, those were all what people want. But then we asked, well, what, are the world, what does the world need? And we connected three lenses. We looked at these uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We looked at the World Economic Forum, Global Risks for Business, and the incredible work of Paul Hawken on Project Drawdown, looking at climate and science. So we took a global governance perspective with the SDGs. We took a business risk perspective and a science assessment of what ultimately drives impact. And we identified nine behaviors and three big themes. Uh, the first theme is how do we use the power of brand and meet these need states in such a way that we could reverse climate change, that we could preserve the resources that we need for living and life, and we could foster more inclusive and resilient communities. And inside of these three sort of themes, we identified these are things that consumers can act upon. These are things that individuals can do that make their own quality of life better, that also make a difference together. These are things that brands can influence and tip and enable 
with their marketing spend and their advertising dollars. We reach billions of people every day. We already influence their aspirations and their behaviors when they shop with us. So how do we also influence their behaviors through and with our brands? And then finally, not only that, but how do we identify what ultimately a material makes the most impact? And so to reverse climate change, it's eat more plants, like Impossible Whopper, to go renewable and to go durable, fewer single-use items and moving to things that are made to last and can be reused and durable. That's how we can, as individuals, pretty straightforward, we can reverse climate change in small ways by doing that, millions of us doing that together, it's game change in a positive way. For uh, preserving resources for life, we can reduce food and water waste. We're all familiar with that, and we feel frustrated by what's in our garbage every day, but also you know, 40% of the food that we produce in our country goes to waste. And so reducing food and water waste, hugely important. How do we help consumers you know, tip this behavior in ways that work for us all? Going circular and going simple. Going circular is new business models around sharing and renting and buying used. And then going simple is simple, clean ingredients that are better for you and ultimately for the biodiversity of the planet. And then just to conclude with these other three, the fostering inclusive and resilient societies, how do we help through our brands um, to expand economic opportunity and equity by buying fair trade, for example, or supporting more equitable and inclusive products and policies, supporting women and girls, and then ultimately showing up as a citizen in your community by volunteering and making your voice heard both at the ballot, but also in the market. So these nine behaviors rooted in global, you know, government uh, priorities, rooted in business risk and rooted in science, help brands think about meeting consumer needs, solving for problems and challenges we face together by bringing equities forward, bringing what we uniquely deliver as brands forward. And so you get things like the Impossible Whopper or Adidas Future Craft Loop, completely circular, high performance apparel. You get things like Target Cat and Jack and you which is an inclusive design of apparel for kids that are in wheelchairs or who have developmental disabilities and need different kinds of buttons and snaps and zippers to dress themselves. Or you get SHIO, the campaign from Land of Lakes to support women farming as generational shifts happening and farmers who were traditionally men are leaving their farms to their daughters supporting women in farming and building a whole you know, new generation of family farmers. So these are all things that are building brand equity, are driving uh, loyalty and deeper relationships with, with consumers, but ultimately working together to solve things bigger than ourselves. That's what uniting systems and stories looks like. That's what the pull factor looks like. And that's what the future of brands that are both meaningful and sustainable and equitable can look like. And I couldn't be more excited. I think with the you know Gen Z on the rise and brands designing more holistically in this way, we're actually beginning to see a new era for brands that can be as transformational in a positive way in our generation as they were perhaps in the 1950s, 60s, where we taught people you know how to buy stuff, and now we're inspiring people to be something. And that to me is an exciting moment. Wow, there's a lot to unpack there. The, the pull factor project, in fact, you can download it from the BBMG website and you have all that information in there. So as you as a listener are digesting this, know that there's some great resources that you can go and, and apply this to. I want to take a break for our good friends over at Sendable to share their story with us. And when we come back, Raphael, I'd like to finish up the show here talking about brands that are doing a good job talking about this, sharing and actually connecting with audiences through the stories that they're telling, because it's one thing, you know, I, I kind of view it as a, a left brain, right brain thing. The systems side is that operational side. How can we functionally make a bigger impact and stand for something greater in this world? But then that emotional right brain, how do we tell this story to actually make people care and to understand our truth and what we believe and value and get through that cynicism that brands are just in this world to make money versus actually helping to elevate people. So when we come back, we'd love to pick your brain about who you see is doing a really good job out there and what our listeners, how they can emulate that right after this message from the good pals over at Sendable. 
Many of you have been following me and the Business of Story on social media for a while now, and I really appreciate it. And if you're not, I hope you will. We share valuable business storytelling tips to help your brand stand out among the awful noise out there. And we do it all thanks to Sendable, a social media management platform that helps over 3,000 digital agencies worldwide to work with their clients, breathe life into their brands, and get their stories heard on social media. What we like about Sendable is they make it super easy to manage your content and your stories online. They allow you to source content from clients and collaborate closely with them to create a social media strategy built on true and proven storytelling principles. You can reliably plan and schedule content to be automatically published to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, and more. And you can demonstrate the impact that this content has had on your audience growth and conversion by reaching out through their in-depth reporting and analytics. There's much, much, much more that you can do. But you know what? I think maybe my favorite feature has to be smart posts functionality. Now, what smart posts are is it makes it incredibly easy to craft social media content and in one step, one single step, customize it for each platform, giving you the best chance of driving engagement and getting people to pay attention to your content. Sendable truly makes managing so many channels an absolute breeze. I know, you have a lot of choices when it comes to social media management apps. So I wanted to let you know we here at The Business of Story can't recommend Sendable enough. Gavin and his team are so great that they have a special offer just for you. You can now get, as a special offer for Business of Story listeners, Sendable's traction plan for only $69 a month. That's a 30% savings. So sign up now at Sendable.com dot com forward slash park 30. Believe me, your stories will take off. Welcome back to the show. I'm Park Howell and with us is BBMG's co-founder Raphael Bemperad taking us through some amazing insights on how do you not only act sustainable, but you tell your story in a very sustainable way that connects with people and moves them to action. So that leads us to really the final big part of this show. Raphael, who do you see is doing a good job? What are they doing and what can our listeners learn from that? Well, you know, as I think about brands that inspire me, you know, I also think about like what does it look like and feel like to create a purposeful brand, a brand that has that deeper sense of meaning. And at BBMG, our sort of approach to this is sort of four steps. And then I'll give you the examples of brands that I think are doing these four things really well. So the first thing to, to deliver around brand purpose, and particularly in this moment with Gen Z rising and having higher expectations for brands, but at the same time, a lot of division in our society. So what does it look like to build brand purpose in these times? And I'd say number one is start with empathy and really put people at the center, their needs, their hopes, and their aspirations, and find those pain points that are not yet solved that you can uniquely deliver against. The second is to define your North Star, and that's ultimately you know, purpose beyond products. And so wider teeth is not a North Star for a toothpaste brand. It has to be something much bigger. And the third is to take a stand, and that's ultimately not necessarily political, but to be proud to stand for what matters to you, to express and embody your values and know what, it, what you look like on your best days and to be able to be willing to have a perspective on the issues that matter to you. And then finally, to invite people in and to start a movement bigger than yourself and to really rally the people and drive participation by everyone. So start with empathy, define your North Star, take a stand on the issues that matter, and ultimately rally the people and bring people together to act in such a ways that are bigger than yourself. And some examples of brands. Now, Ra- I, Raphael, can I stop you yeah, just for a quick please. question? Because it begs a question. Start with empathy and then go to your North Star. I'm wondering, should a brand actually think about flip-flopping that? What is their North Star? What do they really believe in? And then they look at empathy to see how that connects? Or a, does it matter? Yeah. So what you're naming is actually a dynamic and an interplay. And the right brand purpose is exactly the connecting point 
between your internal truth and what matters to you and why you show up and your reason for being and the unmet need and aspiration of your audience. So it's actually exactly the combination of connecting that purpose of your authentic reason for being with the unmet needs of your audience and what you can uniquely fulfill together in the marketplace in the world. So it's ideally rooted in your sense of purpose and reason for being connecting to that unmet need. So it's both of these things. And I think it's, it's really a dynamic that's in dialogue. So it's not step one, go find what people need and then define your purpose in a vacuum. It's actually this interplay and dialogue between what you're really great at and why you show up and your reason for being as a business and the deeply felt unmet needs and aspirations of your audience. Really, yeah. And then with that clarifying. in mind, that leads you together with your purpose to say, okay, if this is what we stand for and what matters, then we have to be prepared to take a stand to fight for it. And that means having a perspective about what's happening in our world and, and what matters to you. And then ultimately, if it just stops at the door of your business or even what your brand is doing, it's not big enough. And so rallying the people and starting a community and building a community that's bigger than yourself, that allows us to bring it out into the world. And I remember once I was at a wedding uh, and it was the rehearsal dinner. We were all going around sharing how much love we felt for the couple. And it, you could just feel it. It was palpable in the room. And the last speaker, whose name was Christiani, said, let's not end here. What's happening in this room, we have to share it outside. We have to bring this into the world. And that, that's the impulse around start a movement, which is when you can harness that purpose and connect it to your team internally, your consumer externally, and build something bigger than yourselves, unleashing that in the world is a really important thing for brands by creating platforms for engagement and action. And I'd like to share a couple of examples, I yeah, think, of brands do. that are doing it exactly that way. I was personally really inspired by the campaign by Heineken, Open Your World. And it was real talk. You can see the video, but it brought people in the UK, which obviously with Brexit and the recent election, there's quite a bit of division and people aren't seeing each other as part of the same future. And obviously, Open Your World is the ethos of Heineken as a brand, a, you know, international brand rooted in Europe, committed to world soccer, which is awesome as a soccer fan myself. But they brought people from different backgrounds together, and they asked them to have a beer. And before they met each other, they answered questions about who they were, what they cared about, and they found people who shared very similar things in common but when they introduced them, they weren't who they were expecting. So a veteran and someone who was transgender, very different. Someone who was actually sort of homophobic, meeting someone who was transgender. You know, and they actually meet each other and find they have a lot more in common than they thought over a beer. And uh, it was, you know, Open Your World became a really elegant way to say not only that, you know, our world needs us to find paths to understand each other better, but beer is a great way to meet each other at the pub or where we are and, and connect. And did that work because they were demonstrating the brand ethos in action versus just paying it, you know, lip service? Just exactly. using lovely words, right. as I've heard. Exactly. And they're actually leaning into the shadow of the brand. You know, their brand is all about open your world, but the, the video that they launched in this experiment was called world apart. And they showed how people with different backgrounds and different expectations could find a new way to connect. And the beer was a vehicle to do it. And, and that's a really great example of like leaning into the shadow of the brand and the, the tough and raw and not easy part. Another great example, a brand campaign that I love was a company called Plum Organics. It's a baby food company. And obviously they're selling products that are organic and delicious for your children. However, the shadow that they revealed in their research for their audience was that parents were so tapped on time and logistics and just, you know, putting their kids first that their own health and their relationship health was falling behind. Um, and it was very virtuous to be a great dad or a great mom by putting your child at the center of everything. And what they actually found was that healthy parents lead to healthy kids. 
And a big part of being a healthy parent is having sex. And so the campaign, which you can look up, was called Do Your Partner. And Do Your Part was really bold. And then Nur was a little quieter. But Do Your Part, obviously, as a parent, but Do Your Partner as a wink saying, hey, guess what? Parents who have more time together, more intimacy and more sex have happier kids. And so they built a campaign not just around the product efficacy for kids getting nourishing foods, but actually having psychologists and social scientists help parents with tips and a guide, you know, nurture their own relationships as parents. Super brave. I am blown away that that got through all the, you know, the stage gates of approval to bring that campaign into the world. So exciting that they could speak more deeply to the needs of their audience. And what they have, both those campaigns have in common, as you said, is they leaned into the shadow or the conflict associated around not necessarily the brand, but how the, the brand is used and so forth. And so many brands are afraid to address that conflict. They're like, no, you know, we, we, we do no harm. We don't want to, you know, possibly reveal something that could be embarrassing or whatever about either ourselves or, or the thought process around our brand. And yet you just demonstrated how powerful that is when they embrace it. Exactly. And, and, and it just connects so much more deeply and authentically when there's the bravery to say something honest and to speak a truth that resonates for your audience, but is also core to your own truth about why you show up. And Plum as a brand was, of course, about nourishing children so that they grow up to be healthy and that they can flourish as humans. But it's also recognizing that the parent's health plays a role in that. And amen to that. I just think there's a lot. We're we're all you know, back to the three tipping points of ecological, technological, and economic, like we're all navigating a whole new moment as people, as co-workers, as parents, as sisters, moms, brothers, dads, and we're all trying to figure it out. And brands that can have some empathy and, and, and truly honor what we're going through, but in a way that's either delightful, like Plum Organics, or just super honest and real like Heineken, I think will really bring out the best in brands and attract and inspire Mm -hmm. consumers. And uh, that to me, you know, super exciting about what's to come. Raphael, final question for you. What kind of guidance or tips do you provide your own clients when they're thinking about how do I communicate this? What should people think about when they start strategically thinking about sharing their stories and what kind of stories to share? At the end of the day, you know, I think brand stories are so powerful because they have the opportunity to influence what people aspire to become, their sense of identity, their sense of community and belonging. Brands have, and brand stories in particular, can help us see ourselves in a new way and see each other in a new way. And so one of the first things that I think is so powerful is to connect that deep empathy and truth for the audience with the deep reason for being and purpose for the brand and share a story that leans more deeply into what matters. I think belong anywhere from Airbnb does that exquisitely. I think the second thing is that storytelling magic will happen when there's an alignment, and this is the pull factor, between what people want in their own lives and what the world needs in our society, in our lives together. And finding that harmonic between what the consumer needs, what the world needs, and what we offer, and the pull factor model, super exciting. So whether it's the seven need states, or the nine behaviors, and your own superpowers as a brand, using the framework, and as you mentioned, it is online at bbmg.com. This framework is free. It's all the research is open source. And we want to give it away, because that's a way to start framing a deeper sense of value. So the first one, a deeper sense of purpose. And this one is a deeper sense of of value and impact. And then the final thing that I would say is that, you know, with the Gen Z reckoning happening, uh, a lack of trust, a desire for brands to be of service to society, and just to conclude on systems and stories and the the new power of brands, 
what we're at a moment park is whether we're going to think of brands through the lens of 1950 and David Ogilvy, which was all about the purpose of advertising. The purpose of brands is to sell, sell, sell. That's the singular purpose of brands. Of course we have to sell our products, but is that really the singular focus and purpose of brands versus a mindset of 2050 and thinking about the future we're creating with the choices we're making right now whether that's for our, ourselves or for our kids or one day our grandkids. And that is not saying like David Ogilvy, our purpose is singularly to sell. It's to embody Mark Pritchard, who's the CMO of Procter & Gamble, was named one of the advertisers of the year and was you know, really guiding force in the Pull Factor project. And what he and the Pull Factor community says is our purpose, our job is to serve to be a force for growth and a force for good. And don't let anyone distract you from that true purpose of brands. And so ultimately, I guess my headline as we can conclude is that we will win when we have a 2050 mindset, not a 1950 mindset. When brands show up in service and we are a force for good and a force for growth. And at the end of the day, we're delivering the aspirational kind of holy grail promised land. We meet your needs without doing harm to anyone else, and we can be part of something bigger than ourselves. Our ethos at BBMG is brands for humans. It's asking how might we unlock the deepest sort of human truths in brands, but unleash our humanity in, in business at the same time. And it is that ethos of brands for humans, brands that ultimately honor our humanity and uplift our humanity that will win. And that is my full bet on the table and what BBMG has been about. And I'm excited because I think that ultimately is not just something meaningful, but I think it's going to win in the market as well. Raphael, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Really, really a fascinating show and terrific to kick off 2020 when people are, you know, always taking that time to rethink who they are, what they're about, what their brand stands for. I think this is a great show for them to give them some tools and especially your research on both the aspirationals and the project poll that can really help inform where they want to take their purpose and how to do it so that they can have a real impact in the world. Amen to that. I mean, as we begin a new year, life is short. There's so many great challenges and needs that we can help to solve. So let's make this a year where our sense of purpose and designing brands with purpose and the impact that we can have together, you know, that's what we can do yeah. and make this a year of impact. Awesome. Well, thank you and thank all of you for listening to this edition of the Business of Story. If you like what you heard and you're maybe you're working with a client or you've got colleagues or you're trying to do this yourself internally at your own brand, share this episode with your friends and family and, and your colleagues out there to help them get this insight. And by all means, download the research. It's really fascinating. It's very easy to digest. And the, the kind folks over at BBMG give you the tools or the insight to be able to go out and really fashion your brand story on purpose. And of course, if I can be of assistance to you in the creation of that story, meet me over at businessofstory.com where I've got a number of free tools, tips, techniques, and talents there ready to help you do your best. I can't forget our good pals over at Sendable. If you're looking to tell a more powerful story online, use Sendable as we do here at Business of Story. We find it to be the most powerful, robust reporting and sharing of our stories online. And of course, if you go over there now for our listeners, you can get 30% off uh, their, their traction package. Just go to sendable.com forward slash park 30. They'll take care of you. And until next week, remember that the most potent story you will ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. Thanks so much for listening.